kind of do a lot of different things, but one of the things I get hired to do is take acoustic sounds and bridge them into electronic music and pop music, uh, and also do like extreme sound design on acoustic sources. So something like when we're talking about what to do for this, I was like, I have a bunch of stuff I could bring, but I heard there was a session um, that you guys had recorded, so I thought, let's just work with that. So I literally didn't really know what I was going to get. So I just had a look at the multi-track and looked at the drums. I thought, cool, we'll do some drum transforming. And I made a couple of, unconsciously, I made a few rules, because um, normally I'd chop the audio, I'd get right in there, I'd do lots of pitch correction, and I'd do a lot of manual work and then get into plugin processing. But I thought, because the Wave stuff's so powerful, I could just do no chopping of the audio and try and get some of the results I'd expect to get if I really manipulate audio, almost like sampling, but using the plugins and to try and get the raw sound and make it something completely different that I maybe, I mean, I'm not going to be, we, we had quite a short time to do this, I'm going to go some of the way into the journey of how I would take a, a live drum performance and make it not live and, and very processed. I ended up choosing four mics to get what I wanted, so I just play them raw. So let's start with the kick and waves have given the greatest gift to all analog drum and actually electronic drum producers talk which is a pitch changing for drums but maintaining the kind of timbre and the transient in a way that's really really clever so i'll just show you what it can do briefly so it's changing the kind of fundamental of the kick drum So you can hear the kind of pitch of the kicks changing, but the character is staying the same, and that is extremely valuable. Now, at this stage, I wanted to try and use as few plugins as possible. So, you know, if you get a session or you get some plugins, you could kind of approximate this thing without having to go really deep into tons and tons of stuff to learn. You could find a couple of channels and see what might be useful. So, I'm using the Omni channel, and I'll just quickly play the result and talk you through it. And you see, I'm not really doing much at all, there's a tiny bit of low end. Um, well, I'm kind of slamming the pre a bit and, and hitting the compressor. But um, I actually also use the insert facility, which I turned off in the end. But I left on to just kind of show you with because um, on this Omni channel, which is really, really useful, you can actually put in any other Waves plugin at any point in the chain. So I added a smack attack just to go nuts. Um, and you can really play with the sound and bring and change it around quite a lot. But in the end, I didn't use it in my balance. I just wanted to show you that you can do that. And you can reorder these any way you like. And that's um, super useful as well. So you can actually change if you, on the arrows. You can move the order of the channel. So it becomes super flexible. Maybe I should quickly talk about that crazy attack on the kick, because it doesn't sound like what you expect. But th these gates are amazing. That's on the fastest possible attack. And if I start to change that a bit, you'll see the electronic style attack disappears. So we get soft again. That's the magic spot. You can add a kind of almost 808 kind of attack on there. The main thing I was looking for, and the, the essence of most sort of drum machine kind of drums, is definition. And obviously that's got a lot of spill. So I went to the Omni channel again because I thought, you know what, let's use the same thing and see if we can get as much as possible from the same plugin in, the, in this idea. So again, I've got the gate and some compression. And I'm just getting a really defined snare. I mean, it's nothing more than just some gating and um, attack. But now I'm going to crush it a bit with Abbey Road Vinyl. I'm using a lot of the phase distortion, which starts to get it almost like a bit crush kind of sound. And if you look at, interesting with the peak level, it's not like crazy different and massively bigger. As a mix engineer, peak level is very important to me and monitoring peak level and seeing what I'm actually doing and and feeling effectively average level to peak level is the efficiency of the sound I'm making in the mix. It's a bit boring saying it like that, but it is super important. Some different plugins than I would normally use in this situation, I put CLA vocals to make a bit more snap and attack on the snare, which gets... And then I'd sometimes even put some slap and things on there, but I didn't this time. But You can get some quite, quite cool, cool effects with it. So then I had a look at the snare bottom to see what I could get from that. And I wanted to make it a little bit more 
processed and characterful sounding. So I went into some of my favorite Waves plugins and just had a fiddle. So I'm adding a kind of a bit of stereo effect and character and obviously brightness. So I'm adding a kind of little motion underneath the whole drum. So I'm not really even using it as an understand mic anymore. I'm using it as kind of almost like a part of a breakbeat that I've derived from the bottom of the snare. And then finally hats. I said about really defining them. Filtering them, adding a bit of flanger and then some motion with a delay. So they don't really sound like played hats much anymore. And then I want to add a bit more character to the snare. So I added a very, very short, crazy ringing delay. Just a bit of character. So that was a kind of basic thing I was going, still kind of, kind of drummy. But what I'm doing with that is using the Abbey Road mastering chain. If you ever listen, I'll, I'll turn it on and off and you'll hear the difference. It's not subtle at all. Then a little bit of EQ shaping. So that was the basis. I was going, okay, that kind of doesn't sound like this anymore. This one thing, vitamin's amazing, and I use this on so many effects. And unusually, actually, I'm using a top end boost on this under snare to get some sort of almost artificial feeling top end from that. I then bust all the drums to a reverb. Did quite a low boomy kind of verb. Which is extreme. But then I bust the snare to it, which is sort of the opposite of what you might do. But I didn't put the snare to the verb, I put the snare to the side chain of the R compressor because keeping the side chain theme going. I created some movement with the reverb, so using it more like an instrumental part than a sense of space. If I bring the level up, you're... to provide a kind of rhythmic pattern. And let's try something more difficult that isn't not technically chopping up the drums, because I want this to be something you can just use plugins just to radically transform something without having to go and do a lot of manual editing. So I thought I'm going to try and add a, like a layer of sort of rough distortion to kind of slightly grit it up. I want to not really send the kick drum to that, but I want to distort the final processed bus sound. So that means I want to send from my drum bus but to kind of take the kick out of the drum bus into the distortion. It was more an exercise than actually a brilliant piece of sort of planned work. So I used a technique I use sometimes. I've got some reverb and some distortion, and most importantly, a gate. So my gate is being triggered by a 1K sine wave tone, which you can just create instantly in tools with a key command, and you can fill up as much 1K as you like. If I just quickly duplicate the playlist, there we go, and I'll just... So I fill that with... Um, the tone now and you're here, it's going to be constantly feeding tone to this, so the gate will always be open. So I've chopped my tone from the kick, and there's quite a simple way of doing that. If I just make a, a channel here, it's just a sort of uh, quite simple bit of chopping and so I copy my kick drum down here I'm just going to quickly go to my strip silence of which there's this isn't Pro Tools dependent at all but I've just highlighted the bass drums with a little bit of pre-delay on them and I'm going to strip them out I'm just going to go back to my tone that's 
consistent through the track. Let's make that into one thing. Then I will copy the kicks down, and I've cut the kicks out of the tone. So we have a tone which is kick-free now. And what I would probably do, due to the nature of most gates and processing, I'll slip it slightly forward, and we'll hear it should be roughly at the same place. OK, so I might have to move it a little bit more. But effectively, I shuffled it a bit to get to the right place. And then when I add that sound in, it lets you basically take the process sound of all the drums and treat them as a thing separately with much more control than just sending individual elements pre my mix bus, which my mix bus is doing quite a lot. I think I'm actually... If I got the key right, yeah, I'm boosting massively to the key of the tune, which I think you see. So I'm adding a bit more weight in that on that note with the drums. And that's quite, I mean, this, this thing kills me. I love this plugin and use it all the time. I'll, I'll show you with and without the low end because that's pretty special. And that's the, like the key of the track, which is really helpful. I, yeah, I do this on a lot of drum programming. It's like, a very clean way of aggressively processing stuff. Does that sound right? Which is really appealing for me, because I do a lot of my character work on a track level with some parallels, and then often I want something that's a very, not particularly characterful, but extremely, extremely powerful processor at the end to bring out what I've done on a track level. I've, I've, I've basically been an in-the-box guy since the mid-90s, and I haven't come from consoles and engineering. Like, you'll never see this screen on my Pro Tools rig ever. And it's never, never on. So I've come from a completely different kind of paradigm. And I've worked a lot in big studios, but I tend to come from a slightly different approach. So I'm, I realize what I do is called top-down mixing, which I had no idea, but that's what it is. I have a very heavy mix bus, multiple mix buses, up to seven, eight pre-mix buses and then mix buses. It's not like instrument groups, it's like mix buses of parallels and processes. And, and so a lot of my technique comes from things like this, this plugin, which is just like so incredibly helpful of like doing quite powerful extreme processes, but without a massive inherent character. So it's, this is like super handy for me. And having some key linked bass pushing is really handy as well. With analog emulated plugins, which I also use a ton of, because I do quite a lot of sort of retro-y kind of stuff as well. I'd use the hell out of that and approach mixing completely differently. But for more electronic stuff, I kind of want clean mashing up. I think that's the best way of saying it. I've tried to use quite a lot of the really powerful waves ones in this session. Smack Attack particularly, actually, that's really great. That's my favorite transient processor by a mile. For a similar kind of reason, is it's fairly full range. It's, 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 a lot of other ones have issues at, at certain areas, and this doesn't. You can really dial in a brutal attack. I use it quite a lot on very natural drum recordings. You'll never hear it really as an effect. You'd hear this, the drums are punchy, and it would almost always be in parallel, which you can do in the plugin as well, actually. And has built-in clipping, and clipping is something I use at masses on bigger pop kind of sounding things. There's a lot of clipping at a lot of different stages, and a lot of frequency-sensitive clipping is very important in my workflow with pre-shaping, if that helps anyone, if they know what I mean, but the pre-shaping, clipping. So I put it on everything, because it's just, uh, okay. So you can do kind of like extreme compression boost, but there's a curve choice, which is super powerful as well. I mean, this is getting more extreme than I would normally do, probably even for me, but. I quite like that, it's pretty cool. The attack side is insanely powerful as well. Getting like serious attack.
I mean, that's not normal. It's really good. <laughs> it's really, really, really powerful. And I'm, I'm over-egging it a bit. And this is probably, honestly, I would almost never use it to that bluntly on a quite smashed up drum track, but it's still doing a load. So actually, that's quite pretty cool. It's like touching the surface of it, but as a parallel within tracks and uh, not just drums either. I use it on uh, pick bass attack. Uh, when the player's really even or a really great player, I've managed to just isolate completely the pick. And that's been quite useful in sending that to different processes and things. Most mixes I send nowadays don't change when they go through the mastering at all. So they will be completely finished when I send them, most of them, and with limiting and everything most of the time. If it's an album of more conventional music, I would have no limiting, but all my mix process would stay, and that would be quite extensive. Um, but yeah, mastering for singles, I don't do, and this is even for major label stuff now, it very rarely goes to mastering much. And if it does, I want, don't want it to change most of the time. But that's because that's a certain style of thing I do. I do quite a bit for movie mixing and stuff, and that's no mix bus at all. Nothing. You can't have any because the stems have to exactly match the uh, mix you deliver. So that's a completely different mix philosophy. It's a completely different technique and is, is great because your mix has to be completely done without any, anything on the mix bus at all. And that's really, that's quite challenging sometimes actually. But yeah, mastering wise, I don't think of that. I just finish the mix now completely. So it's not even a process for most stuff. It depends, depends what it is. Re really depends. The more guitars there are, the less I master seems to be the equation I might put in. <laughs> yeah. Often people think about mastering as loudness and that doesn't really factor for me anymore. It, it's often when you're doing the larger pop mixes, what you get delivered is what one of the last things I mixed was a demo comfortably hitting minus two RMS the whole way through and you can't deliver it quieter. So it's going to be a massively loud thing. So it's not even a, it, that's the mix now. Because the mix sound that the demo, the listening, production listening copy has, which people have been listening to for up to a year easily, is relying on smashing into a limiter. So that's not part of the process anymore. It's the mix. It's not even mastering. So it really is so genre dependent. Mixing is, which took me a while to work out as well, because I came from a definitely electronic kind of path, was that it's just about how it feels and nothing else really matters. I would say uh, that's it. So all, all of the other stuff is kind of cool, but it becomes techniques you use in order to facilitate the feel of that bit of music and nothing else matters. Because lots of stuff you'll hear which isn't sound, doesn't sound great, but sounds great. And that's more the approach I take on everything. It's, um, if you don't know how to do things properly, you're very likely to become extremely unstuck in a lot of professional situations. But the aim isn't to know how to do it properly, it's to be able to make something that feels incredible. That's, I think, what gets everybody the gigs and what people like listening to. Yeah. Thanks. 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 Thank you.